This is Barcelona, a city of one and a half million, nestling between the mountains and the Mediterranean Sea. Like many other modern megalopolises, it has urban railways, a metro, electric buses, and even a funicular. But nowadays, the center of attention is the tram, a mode of transportation that, with the application of the latest technology, combines the speed of off-street transport with comfort and accessibility. The Barcelona tram system was built completely from scratch only 20 years ago, and it's 30 kilometers, equipped with 42 articulated Alstom Citadus 302 streetcars, are a wonderful example of a state-of-the-art 21st century public transit service surrounded by beautiful Spanish landscapes and wonderful architecture. But before we take a ride, let's find out a little bit about its history. This historic Barcelona tram was filmed entirely in black and white. It fit perfectly with the insane street traffic of those days. And in 1929, the network reached its maximum extent, comparable to the metro network we have today. But with the 30s came a severe economic crisis followed by the Spanish Civil War, infrastructure damage from which has never been fully repaired. The country became a dictatorship, and it was the 40% increase in the Barcelona tram fare that triggered the first large-scale strike against the Franco regime, when 99% of citizens stopped using the tram as a sign of protest. The rapid growth in the number of automobiles once and for all pushed the streetcars into the background. Making a typical mistake of that time, the city dismantled the tram lines, considered in those days to be unattractive and obstructive to car traffic. In 1961, these used trams from Washington, D.C. would be the last vehicles the city of Barcelona bought. Ten years later, the last two remaining lines were closed. In the 70s, the oil crisis momentarily made them question their decision. But it was already too late, and the Catalonian capital spent the next 30 years filled with the fumes of noisy diesel engines. Barcelona's modern tram system opened in the spring of 2004. Built from scratch, it consists of two separate networks in the outskirts at opposite ends of the city. The first one is called Tram Baix, after Baix Llobregat, the area around the Llobregat River, which forms the western border of the metropolitan area. The other one is Tram Besos, named after the Besos River, part of the eastern border of the city itself. The longest tram route, number two, belongs to the Western Trambaix network and starts on a minor one-track line in the town of saint juan des At each station on the route, a second track allows oncoming trams to pass each other. Service frequency here varies from 12 minutes during rush hour to 20 minutes at weekends. Throughout the entire length of the system, tram lines are completely separate from car lanes and, whenever possible, laid on a green roadbed. Spain is a mountainous country, and we'll see lots of beautiful climbs and curves along the route. Passing beneath a bridge that carries one of Barcelona's seven suburban railway lines, we drop down towards the center of the town and pull up at the beautifully named tram stop Bon Viaje, which is Catalan for Bon Voyage, named in honor of the nearby chapel of St. Mary of the Good Trip. This is where the double track line begins, and route number one joins us until the end of the journey having the interval between trams. This is a nice town. Like most of the Barcelona suburbs, it has a thousand years of history and numerous architectural sites. But the tram travels along the edge of the urban area and just beyond these nine-story concrete blocks of flats are the vegetable farms of the Llobregat River Valley Agricultural Park. The river has fed and watered Barcelona for many centuries. And in honor of that, an old water pumping station has been converted into a wonderful water museum, featuring all of the building's original steam-powered equipment. To leave the valley, the tram must make a demanding uphill climb. This is the steepest slope in the entire Barcelona tram network, 7.5%, and one of the many impressive vantage points. At the top of the hill, the tram enters a tunnel under a railway line. This is Cornellà Centre Station, a three-story transport hub where tram, metro, and commuter train lines meet, and where you'll also find a park-and-ride service. Leaving the station, 
we're finally on our way down a wide straight street. Most of it is built up with a typical assortment of apartment blocks. Among them, the occasional oasis, such as this garden with its twin villas. It's rush hour now, and trams circulate every few minutes as we're joined by Line 3, which we'll be looking at later. The average speed on this section is 22 kilometers per hour, which isn't bad compared to the Metro's 26. Despite their bulk, trams accelerate quickly thanks to their efficient electric engines and can go as fast as cars, not exceeding the city speed limit, of course. The road was specially designed to smooth their passage, and so, while other vehicles have to circulate around roundabouts, trams are allowed to take a shortcut or two. Barcelona's intersection priority system works pretty well. At most crossings, red traffic lights turn green on the tram car's approach. With all the benefits of off-street transport, but affordable and pleasant to use, 21st century trams are truly the number one transit system in a modern city. And here's the next town on our journey, Esplugues de Llobregat, featuring iconic symbol towers. Three 17-floor concrete blocks, decorated with dark brick and light artificial stone, and sharing a common ground floor. Barcelona is known primarily for Gaudi's modernist gems. However, the tram gives us a glimpse of the other side. The rails across the B20 motorway, part of the Barcelona ring road, and the Paradise City gets closer with every minute. Shopping malls get fancier to match the exquisite taste of the capital's residents. The N340 National Route, having come a thousand kilometers from the southern shore of the Iberian Peninsula, goes up and down on its final stage, preparing to turn into the longest high street in Europe. On our left, we see the main building of a major electricity substation in Col Blanc. Back in 2007, a fallen cable here blacked out almost the entire city, leaving some districts living in the Stone Age for almost four days. Before the advent of electricity, these open fields were vineyards. This 18th century farm building has made it to the present day, and surprisingly is the property of the Barcelona football team, which planned to repurpose it as a residence and football school, but was prevented from doing so by neighbors' associations. The tram stop still bears the original name of the farm, Can Regal, a dozen meters further on, and we're finally in Barcelona itself. The capital greets us with one of its many urban gardens. City Hall hands these plots of land to pensioners for free to make the city greener and engage its senior citizens in physical and social activity. Here people grow vegetables, herbs, and seasonal flowers, and city kids can learn about where their food really comes from. The tram stop here is a bit unusual with three tracks instead of two. The middle one isn't in use at the moment, but the platform's been built, and in the future, when the two tram networks become one, it'll be used to reverse the tram cars on a new route that'll be serving only Barcelona itself. Our tram continues its journey past the high fence of the Royal Polo Club of Barcelona. This is a sporty district, and the famous Camp No football stadium isn't far from here. Next, it's Zona Universitaria, a university district that's home to half of the faculties of Barcelona University and the entire campus of Catalonia Polytechnic University. During the construction of the tramway, they evidently made no compromises. Because the street was only two lanes wide, they closed it to regular traffic and left it for the exclusive use of pedestrians and trams. From there, the line turns to the diagonal, Barcelona's widest, poshest, and most important avenue. The name diagonal means exactly what it says. The avenue cuts diagonally from corner to corner across the city, which is laid out as a square. It attracts a lot of transit traffic, and beside the tram lines and two-lane frontage roads on each side, the main carriageway has seven lanes, three of which are reversible. This noisy avenue is surrounded by peaceful areas of greenery, with the Rola Mountains in the background. The brutalist concrete buildings of the Faculty of Economics and Business adjoin the elegant gates of the Pedralbes Palace Gardens. The faculties of physics and chemistry are just across the street. The wide sidewalks are popular with joggers and cyclists. After passing Pope Pius XII Square, the diagonal turns into a business district. The jewel of Barcelona's business architecture is the headquarters of Caixa Bank, 
consisting of two dark skyscrapers crowned with a rotating company logo and a third, smaller, cube-shaped building. They are separated by the typically unsightly barn of El Corte Inglés, the nation's biggest department store chain, whose name derives from that of a small tailor shop in Madrid, bought out along with the entire block with the intention of demolishing it and building the first branch 90 years ago. The Caixa Bank logo and traffic lights are synchronized, which makes it impossible to get a good shot of a tram passing while the logo is facing Queen Maria Cristina Square, no matter how long you wait. Just kidding, I've only been trying to do it for 45 minutes. Another interesting building is the one that was originally built for the now defunct Banca Catalana, a masterpiece of vertical landscaping that inspired the shift from traditional Barcelona architecture to newer trends at the beginning of the 70s. The area also includes some interesting residential buildings, like this complex of seven apartment blocks. Barcelona II opened in 1966. The building facing the diagonal is much fancier than the others, and all of them share a common commercial ground floor. Buses suffer from a major disadvantage when serving big arterial roads like the diagonal. As demand increases, you can't just add more buses, you need more drivers as well. And what's worse, when there are too many buses, they tend to queue up at the stops, significantly reducing service speed. This is not the case with the tram. To meet increased demand, two or even more carriages can be attached. Tram stops in Barcelona are all 60 meters long and can accommodate trams that are double the length of the five-section articulated Alstom Citadus 302 streetcars that are normally used. The option of extending the vehicles will be invaluable when the two isolated tram systems are connected to form another rapid transit line running through the entire city. And although it won't be able to compete with the metro on long end-to-end -end journeys, many underground users will save time thanks to more frequent and convenient stops and the absence of lengthy passages, staircases, and escalators. The long-term plan for the new Barcelona tram never envisaged two isolated networks. They were always going to be connected. The lines are currently separate because the central section is being built last due to the enormous cost of construction in the dense and busy city center. Apart from technical difficulties, there are political obstacles too. The car lobby is still strong, and as if the last 50 years have never happened, trams are said to cause traffic jams because they reduce the number of lanes available to other traffic and require the readjustment of traffic lights. Furthermore, as a consequence of these hypothetical traffic jams, the most silent vehicle on the road, which emits no fumes or toxic dust from rubber tires, is accused of increasing the level of noise contamination and polluting the atmosphere. Tram cars moving on very predictable, clearly marked trajectories and controlled by professional drivers are presented as a new danger on the street, much more harmful than the existing seven lanes of high-intensity traffic. People commuting in premium-class cars with private drivers are suggesting that because electric buses no longer emit smoke, they offer perfectly adequate transportation for everyone else, and that such things as smooth running and a spacious interior have no place in the equation. Because it's such a controversial topic, the tram has turned into a powerful political weapon. During the 16 years that have passed since the two tram systems have been in operation, Barcelona City Hall has held numerous discussions on building a connection between the systems, none of which were expected to reach a certain decision. Increased concerns over climate change and the subsequent coronavirus crisis tipped the balance in favor of comfortable, environment-friendly public transportation, and the project for the construction of the first part of the connection has finally been approved. As early as next year, we'll see work begin on improving the diagonal. We've reached the end of our first tram journey here at Francesc Macia Square. Trams arrive at one of the dead ends, the driver moves from the front cabin to the rear, and the tram sets off in the opposite direction, passing through a switch if necessary on its journey back to the suburbs. This is one of the city's emblematic squares, home of the headquarters of the well-known newspaper La Vanguardia. More than one generation of Barcelona citizens has looked up to see the Danon logo on the roof of one of the buildings, a multinational food product corporation that was born here in the Earl City, as they often call it. It will be very exciting to see how the tram will navigate this roundabout. They wouldn't dare cut down the trees, right? 
How would they reorganize the shady green diagonal to accommodate high-speed transport without harming the landscape? Will Barcelona's iconic left-side bike lanes remain? Let's wait and see. The future is inevitable, and countless asphalt squares will sooner or later be converted into green spaces. Diagonal Avenue, with all its modernist architectural jewels, will become one of Europe's most beautiful tram rides. Reaching Gloria Square, Barcelona's eternal construction site, where, once again, we can see the trams circulating.